my presentation actually follows on quite, uh, quite closely for, to Venura's. That's largely because we've been working with Venura for the last sort of 18 months, two years or so. Just a, an agenda for, for the session. Uh, unlike some of the, the uh, keynote speakers this morning, I'm going to talk about SLA Mobile first, rather than squeezing it on the end, and then we'll get through to the, uh, the main content, which is around uh, Mobile Connect in the context of the mobile operator's uh, business. So first of all, this is a bit of a mission statement for uh, SLA Mobile. A uh, couple of key points to, uh, to highlight here is that we see uh, ourselves as working in partnership with uh, most of our oper operator customers. Uh, our customer base is uh, entirely uh, mobile network operators around the world. Um, and we work very much in a niche space, which is the, the cusp of the telco and internet world. Uh, we've been working uh, in that space for over 10 years. Uh, and th this is a very much an evolving uh, part, of, part of the industry where things like monetization models and, uh, and, and certainly uh, commercial uh, models are not quite as, as clear cut as they could be. Operators in particular have huge amounts of uh, data and network assets which they're not monetizing as well as they could. So we're, we're helping with that journey to try and make sure that mobile operators don't become completely uh, utility-based. To put this in a slightly different uh, perspective, um, I've got a pointer on here, but we operate in this space. So we're, we're, we're providing a range of services on behalf of mobile network operators using a range of platforms. So WSO2 is one of the platforms that, uh, that, that we, uh, we, we use, uh, but we're, we're not exclusive to WSO2. Often our, our mobile network operator partners uh, have incumbent platforms, so we have to sort of uh, work with what they have. The key point is that our, our uh, experience is around understanding the business area, understanding the, the uh, challenges faced by operators around the world, um, and also recognizing this as an evolving world. So the digital services that we have in, the, uh, in, in that middle group started off primarily um, in the content space, in the, in the early days of the mobile internet world, the first sort of partnership models between operators uh, and, and content providers were the first services that were actually provided to the uh, mobile operator customers. So we, we trace our, our roots back to, to that era. Obviously now, uh, many, many digital services are, are developed in partnership with, with other well-known and sometimes over-the-top brands, and that kind of blurring of, of whose brand uh, is, is to the fore for a service is, is, uh, is a bit sort of key part of the, how the industry has evolved. Um, either way, control of that, that uh, relationship is part of our role in, in helping operators maintain control with their partners. Um, in this context, I'm going to be talking about uh, Mobile Connect and, and identity, but that is just one other service. Uh, we've got DOB, which is Direct Operator Billing, uh, as, as highlighted in this. That's, that's actually the, the first service that tends to be rolled out. Typically, you build on the other operator services, including uh, ID. Uh, we're truly global. Uh, we have a, a, our, our group headquarters in, in Belfast, in, in Northern Ireland. But uh, probably the, the, the key office for us is our Kuala Lumpur uh, base, which is where our technical operations and technical development work uh, takes place. And as you can see, we've, we, have, uh, we have worked across the globe. But uh, if you see the box over on the right there, you can see the Axiata Group. One of the reasons we're here today is that they're, they're a, a key customer of ours, or key partner. And as Venura pointed out before, the, the way that the Axiata Group uh, started off with the work in dialogue and then brought that to the rest of the group, has been, we've, we've helped with that journey. Um, and obviously being based in Kuala Lumpur, which is where the Axiata Group Services is based, uh, has, has been part of that. Um, but there are a couple other things I'll point out here. We have uh, Vodafone and Zane. Both of those are, are group companies. And it, it, it's, if I talk about the niche of the internet and the mobile world, probably the, the niche within the niche is group operators who have the ambition to offer services across their group. Uh, it's much, much easier to develop once and deploy many than to, um, to you know, individually develop for, for local markets. So, moving on to uh, identity. Um, and I'm, I've, 
I'm going to flit between identity and authentication because it, conf it confuses people all the time. So, so my definition, my definition of the two, is that uh, identity is is me. Authentication is that the thing that the, is the proxy for me is valid to do the thing that it's trying to do. Now, I understood that. I'm not sure if anyone else did, but, but I'll come on to that in a bit later. Now, at the moment, those two terms are being confused a lot. I'm probably going to confuse to begin with, primarily talking about authentication elements of the ID world, but eventually I, identity and authentication will come together and, and we will fix that, that particular problem. In the meantime, however, it's a huge problem because without uh, a more secure version, effectively a, a primitive authentication, which is currently what username and password uh, uh, services provide, are, are frankly being uh, discredited around the world. Um, actually, so some of you might recognize some of this, these clips are from a, a GSMA presentation, but actually this is also uh, a slide that I presented, particularly to the Middle Eastern operators. And one of the things that uh, I've noticed is that many of the, the, the branded companies on the, on the bottom right there are uh, US-based, not regulated by telco uh, locally, um, and hence don't have the same restrictions that many telcos have in their local markets. Now, in, in the markets where telcos are heavily restricted, they can use that as, a, as a, an asset because they can demonstrate that they're, they're under heavy uh, legislative pressure and license pressure to, to maintain a degree of standard. So in theory, telcos must be much more secure than these people who are not regulated. Um, obviously, the, the username password piece has been around for a long time. What's relatively new is at the bottom there, uh, this is a figure that comes from the FIDO Alliance, where they've calculated that 3.5 million US dollars per security breach is the average. Now, some are way, way more than that. Some are, some are less than that. And, and there are, for every, every one that becomes publicized, there are hundreds that aren't. It's a very, very big problem, and it's costing the industry a lot of money. I'll come back to the industry money later. The other thing about uh, ID is that behind your username and password, you usually store a whole bunch of other details. And access to that information, I mean, obviously lots of publicized security breaches around photographs and so on is, is, uh, is, is in the public domain. But pretty much everything you've ever entered in any website is at risk as a result of this. So, that, so that there needs to be something that's uh, more secure. People become less comfortable with, uh, with what they're storing online, and as a result, it, it, it inhibits the development of extra services because people are just not so willing to, to put, every, put uh, their information out there. So first use of the uh, Mobile Connect brand there. Um, the difference with Mobile Connect is, that, and it is growing, I'm not, I'm not saying for one moment it's the perfect solution right yet, there's a lot of things that have to be done as well. But if you think about it, when you're going into any kind of uh, web-based service, you put your username and password, you're actively uh, participating in, in, in that security. But when you make a call or when you send an SMS, you know, it's, a, it's a very frictionless uh, experience. You don't have to enter a PIN or a, or a, a password every time you want to make a call or, or, um, or, or send a text, although some people may put that onto their, onto their screensavers. Uh, but that wasn't always the case. I mean, I remember in the early days of, of uh, e-commerce, of, mob of mobile internet, that some people expected a PIN or a password every time you made a purchase of, you know, three euros or something. So, you know, the, the, the industry has evolved such that they accept a degree of frictionless uh, transaction up to a certain monetary value. Now, obviously, the, the telcos already have the infrastructure. Mobile operators obviously already have mechanisms for authenticating customers. Uh, whilst they're making their calls and, and, and sending texts and so on. So by being able to use that kind of uh, capability in conjunction with some of the you know, less sensitive transaction information means, means a, a more frictionless, or does that make sense? A, a less frictioned uh, transaction can take place, which, which, is, which is key particularly for uh, things like the banking community where the, the uh, levels of interaction uh, for certain sort of low-risk transactions are still prohibited by people having to get a little uh, random number generator out of their pocket or something like that and, and, and go a different way. Um, 
So the other thing, of course, is that uh, coming back to that branding thing, the, the mobile operators have have you know well-known brands for, for for their local market, and they have uh, a, a captive market in that the, their customer base already signed up with a whole bunch of services. Usually have uh, all sorts of authentication in place. Offering that to third parties. I mean, uh, Venura talked about the. Um, uh, Facebook Connect and Google Connect uh, alternative you see on the bottom there. The idea is that Mobile Connect is, is another version of that, or at least looks like that to, to the end customer for these types of services. Where people don't want to use Google uh, or, or Facebook, they, they use uh, something provided by their operator. But I personally think it's just a start, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, so one, one, of the, one of the points, when we talk about ID, I think Venera talked about, uh, you know, briefly how it's going to be monetized and if it's going to be monetized. Um, and I've, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But I do also think you've got to ask yourself, why should it be? So uh, this is a this is a chart from a couple of years ago, and it sort of it shows the spend uh, across a bunch of operators around the world. This is at the end of 2013. Um, so subscriber acquisition cost and subscriber retention cost. For, for these markets, you see it's between 12 and 28% of their service revenues. So in other words, they're already leaking quite a bit of cash just to keep hold of their customer base. Now that's quite important because those of us that worked in the telco, inside the telcos for many, many years, know that trying to create a business case for something that isn't directly monetizable is very hard. However, when you see that people have got millions, potentially uh, as a way of you know, subsidizing a, a, a earlier upgrade of a smartphone just to try and retain that customer. You see, it's, it's frustrating when you're trying to spend perhaps a few hundred thousand on f delivering something that will have the, a similar effect. And it does feel that, I, I used to feel quite frustrated that I had to find budget in order to do that, whereas these people, or the, these service uh, areas were already getting 10 times, 100 times more the budget to do stuff that you know, I could have helped with. And I think this is important. So if anyone is in that space trying to do the business case for, for these kind of products, they need to remember that the customer retention or the customer acquisition budget should also be seen as part of the revenue stream for, for developing this kind of service. But there are other benefits as well. So obviously, if the service is uh, frictionless, or certainly has less friction than previously, um, the, the more people are going to use it. So, so that's going to be used more data services. It's going to allow perhaps greater revenue share deals with partnering and so on. So it's, so it's going to drive up use. Um, it also means that, the, depending on the branding, that the operator is part of the customer's experience, which means they're staying relevant. There's a, there's a brand touch point every time, rather than maybe just at the end of the month when the bill turns up, which is another important piece. Um, also, that third point is important because when they, if, they, if someone's logged into a website on a, on a Wi-Fi network where there's, where there's not the, the, the classic mobile uh, analytic capability, the fact that they've logged into that site means there is some analysis of what that customer's behavior is, which is something that currently operators won't have access to, but they can have access to it if their branded login is being used. Um, and obviously, as you, as you bring services together, that if you have the core uh, identity of the core authentication services of the, of the customer base sort of pre-developed. It doesn't have to be de developed every new service. It just is another plug-in. Uh, there are, however, some direct uh, monetization opportunities. As Swisscom um, sell uh, identity to, uh, to, to uh, the Swiss Postal Service around about three euros per customer. So to guarantee authentication for certain types of code developed uh, product sets. So there are examples of that, but it's quite difficult to get those. So if uh, an operator is to, is to do this, the first thing, and I think the most important thing, is to ensure that all their own internal products are, are developed using this stuff. Now, I, I, for many, many years, developed products for, for, uh, for Vodafone. And, uh, Due to internal sanctions and silos, you know, there's always different competing organisations doing that. Um, I won't tell any stories about uh, Deutsche Telekom, but you know, it's not always easy to get everyone on board in an organisation to 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 use a core product. And I think that has to be overcome as well, because if you want to integrate other people's services, you have to integrate your own. Um, 
and maybe do that retrospectively as well. So, you know, enhance existing product sets by, by bringing the, uh, the, the, the core login or any kind of automatic login into, into, the, uh, into those products as well. Uh, Venura talked about the, the different uh, groups of ecosystems, um, particularly hubs within hubs and hubs talking to other hubs. That, that kind of connected world is important, but it's really, really difficult unless there is an attractive proposition that everyone wants to sign up to. So actually procuring uh, external service providers to, um, to, to, to connect to these gateways is, is probably the, the quickest way of getting uh, adoption across a, a number of gateways. You know, once you've got a, once you've got a, a partner on board and, and it's an attractive partner, everyone wants a piece of it, it's much easier to connect the lower hubs than it is to reconnect uh, all the way through end to end with it from the top half. Um, but also, uh, ID is just one service, and it should be connected to all the other services and offered in, a, in, a, in, a, in conjunction. Now, we've talked about GSMA Exchange uh, briefly. GSMA Exchange came from the GSMA One API program, which was uh, pretty much a bunch of APIs not including identity. Identity is being tacked onto that, and they, they, they started off in separate places. They're now, if you're familiar with the GSMA, it's now part of the, the customer data stream. Um, but I think it's important that the ID is seen just as one more service in conjunction with everything else. So, oh, that's, uh, that's got a bit bigger than it should have been. That's because this, this was developed on Keynote and been, been swapped to uh, PowerPoint, almost certainly. Um, just to show the link between all, all these entities. So, uh, SLA uh, are an approved integrator for WC2 Telco stack, which is interesting because we're actually uh, we're actually hosting and running the WSO2 telco stack for the Axiata Group um, in Amazon sites in Singapore, um, which, is, which is where uh, GSMA recognizes that, uh, I'll come down to this one, that, that should say, WSO2 ID product is one of the two approved mobile connect accelerator solutions. So MCX, if you go to the GSMA, ask who they approve, they approve Ericsson and WSO2. The difference between Ericsson and WSO2 is that uh, Ericsson's is a standalone identity product, WSO2's is integrated with all of its other uh, API products. Also WSO2 is open source, Ericsson's not. Uh, also we p participate in the GSMA's um, personal data work stream, which, which is important because the current GSMA Mobile Connect solution is just the beginning. There are evolutions uh, to, to, come, uh, to come through, including additional levels of authentication. Uh, this is as techy as this diagram, is, as this presentation is going to get, but what I'm trying to show here is that the identity part is, in our context, which is the blue, is, is completely integrated with the rest of the WSO2 and uh, Axiata. Uh, uh, product set. So, got the API manager at the, at the top. The, the gateways and the API managers and um, some of the adapters were, were already in place as part of the sort of uh, API exchange uh, project. So, the, so the identity server, the user store, which is what we've called it, and I think um, it was customer registry in in in, in Venura's, uh, diagram, um, and the, and the various authentication adapters are they're all they're all part of the. The, the bigger solution. And I think it's very important that it's seen that way. Um, if, it's a, if it's a solution on its own, I, I don't think it integrates with the rest of the product set. So you can't get the complete frictionless uh, capability. Right, this is, this, is, uh, this is why it's just the start. So at the moment, Mobile Connect is really, from a user experience, it's, it's active authentication. So you're either clicking yes to, to a request or you're putting in a pin or you're doing something. So it's active. Passive authentication is happening behind the scenes, and it comes in different forms. It can be um, using signaling data, maybe verifying location, a few bun bunch of things like that. They're also, and this is a bit more controversial because it depends on permissions, but you could also uh, look back over historic data to make sure that, that uh, customer uh, patterns or, or customer routines are being followed. So to identify when a customer is in their routine or when they're out of their routine, in which case you trigger different levels of authentication. All this stuff behind the scenes is being discussed within the uh, GSMA Mobile Connect uh, work streams. Um, 
so th and, that, and that adds up to the multi-factor multi, uh, risk mitigation. FIDO, FIDO, uh, so Fast ID Online, um, you know, it's sort of, uh, being championed by uh, very, very large companies like Google and Microsoft. Now, what, what FIDO is do, doing primarily in this context, in my opinion, is providing the ability to link the ID part to the authentication piece. So you, you know that all uh, Android devices and uh, Windows devices from now on have uh, FIDO approved uh, biometric capability. Um, FIDO Alliance and GSMA have, have co-written, uh, I, I think it's public, they've, they've, they're basically bringing the products together. So the, the, to the, the FIDO Alliance uh, specification for the, for the uh, biometric readers on the devices will integrate with the, uh, the back-end GSMA uh, mobile collect solution, which is great because it means that you, or the device is proving it's a valid proxy for you, and then when it's, when it's done that, the authentication around Mobile Connect uh, is much more powerful because it's, it, it's basically controlling what your proxy can do. So you get authentication and ID together. Now, obviously, that increased confidence, and I think personally that, that particular breakthrough will be very important, means that it's, it's the true jump into uh, everything being mobile. And you probably know that banks at the moment, they'll, they'll typically allow a subset of their, their transactions to be carried out uh, on a mobile device, but you still have to revert to something which they perceive more secure, more clunky, more friction to do the, uh, the, the uh, high-risk stuff. As, as, as confidence grows, those will become mobile as well, in which case uh, we, we're in a much more agile and, and mobile uh, connected world. Um, also, government agencies. This works two ways. Uh, the UK government in particular is, is uh, spending a lot of money on trying to uh, get everyone online and, and connected, and securely so. But it also means they're opening up that data. So if you, if you, again, this is a constant battle about risk mitigation, but if you can compare maybe passport data or, or, or uh, government-owned personal data for security purposes with other information the customer's already input, plus some behavioral stuff, plus some biometrics. Combine those together, so basically getting the information from a different source at transaction time means security is much better. None of it will work, however, unless operators uh, actually join forces. Now, you've got the eternal problem, chicken and egg, Every, every partner who wants to deal with the mobile customer base wants the entire customer base. Every operator wants to be able to sell individually to the, uh, to, to the, uh, to the, the, the partners. As per Venura's uh, kind of collection of, of gateways, that's the technical solution. The commercial solution is much harder because people are still in the not invented here, the sort of siloed, it's my brand type thing. And I think that until that particular piece is cracked, or at least operators are forced into combining under some other uh, framework, it, it's, they're, they're going to miss out. I think that's probably it. There we go. <laughs>